Welcome to Never Again Is Now, a podcast about anti-Semitism. I am Evelyn Marcus, and in addition to being a psychologist, I'm featured in the documentary about anti-Semitism, Never Again Is Now. I am a Dutch Jew and the daughter of Holocaust survivors. In 2006, I immigrated to the United States because of the rising anti-Semitism in Europe. I am Phyllis Zimbler Miller, the founder of the free nonfiction Holocaust theater project, ThinEdgeOfTheWedge.com. My grandparents came at the turn of the last century from Latvia and Russia. And I grew up in a small town where I was the only Jewish child in all my public school classes. In 1970, my husband, a US Army officer, and I were stationed in Munich, Germany, only 25 years after the end of World War II. Our guest for this episode is Alexa Smith. Alexa graduated from the University of Michigan in 2019 with a major in art and design and minors in Judaic studies and art history. She now does marketing and graphic design and serves as the New York City chapter president of Zionists, a progressive Zionist movement. In her senior year of college, she was confronted with anti-Semitism in the classroom and chose to speak up. Welcome, Alexa, to our show, and thank you for coming on. Thank you both so much for having me and giving me a voice to speak on your platform. It's amazing what you guys are doing. Thank you. Um, Alexa, could you share with us uh, the the anti-Semitic incidents or, or incident that you experienced? Yeah, so on University of Michigan's campus, I was an art and design student and we had to go to a mandatory lecture in order to receive credit um, for our class and for our degree. And it was a speaker series where they would bring in very cool speakers most of the time um, and where they would showcase their work. And um, Many times there was a lot of anti-Israel rhetoric as well, and it made me uncomfortable. Um, I had gone to the administration, to the dean of the school before, and it was swept under the rug. Um, And so my senior year, it happened again, but even worse. Um, They had a speaker um, come to campus. His name was Emery Douglas, and he was a graphic novelist for the Black Panther movement. And so I was really excited. I thought it was going to be a great, awesome, cool lecture. Um, And it ended up being all of this Israel bashing, but so much worse. Um, He showed a slide that had Adolf Hitler juxtaposed with an image of Bibi Netanyahu, the former prime prime minister of Israel, um, with guilty of genocide written above their foreheads. And he was speaking this to a thousand person lecture um, with 500 students that were in attendance because it was mandatory um, as if it was truth. And it was shocking to my system. Um, I looked around the room and I couldn't believe that this was happening. Um, And one of my professors was actually sitting next to me and I looked at his face It was like poker face. And I couldn't believe that there was no expression of emotion on his face. And I felt so alone in this crowd. And there's not many Jews in the art school, but there are a few. And um, so I wasn't sitting next to any, and it definitely appeared that way. Um, And the lecture kept going. And I, I wanted, I had to leave the lecture because I was so upset. And then I had the courage to come back in um, to, you know, showcase what was going on. And there was another image of pigs. um, And it said the puppet state of Zionism is the puppet state of imperialism on the top of the image. And a bunch of pigs with um, Zionist pig in the front and center with money backpacks and um, drinking from money water bottles and basically in front and in control of business basically was what it was alluding to um, of the US and France and all these other countries behind them. And the pig in front was holding a Jewish conspiracy wand, which is age old anti-Semitism from the books of Goebbels and even further on. Um, So 
that to me was, I mean, both of those images were not this, we weren't talking about Israel anymore. We were talking about pure anti-Semitism. And there was like no reaction from the crowd. And so having experienced speaking with the administration about this before, I knew that nothing was going to change once again. So I went to Facebook and I shared my experience. And the reason that I did this is because I didn't want any student to ever feel as isolated as I had in my classroom. Um, and so the administration eventually caught wind of it um, and they, the Dean asked to speak with me. And so when I went to speak with him, I brought a few other Jewish students who were in that classroom to speak with me as well. Um, and they were just as um, outraged. I don't just completely like sick to their stomachs, um, but they didn't feel like, the courage or um, confident enough to speak out against the administration. So it was really nice that, um, you know, once I did, they, they followed suit. And so it was nice to have them with me. And when we spoke with the administration or the Dean for that matter, um, he expressed his apologies um, and he wanted to know like what we thought he could do. And so I came prepared and I, I had asked that he adopt some sort of, or asked the administration to adopt some sort of definition of anti-Semitism so that when it happens in a classroom, a professor knows to stand up and say, this is not okay. And, you know, not let it go on further, but even if it did, at least make an apology. Well, after speaking with the Dean, um, it seemed like it was very positive. So I started um, collecting more students on campus. Um, and we started a student movement um, that was calling the university to adopt the IHRA definition of anti-Semitism, which is adopted by many governments, the US government, State Department, um, and many schools in Europe. Um, I think that some have actually adopted the definition now after um, this whole situation happened um, in the US, but University of Michigan has not done so. I met with the university's president one-on-one -on -one, and he basically said to me, well, I think that it's subjective whether it was anti-Semitism. And I could see why people who viewed Israel as or Bibi Netanyahu as an Adolf Hitler figure and why he might be guilty of the genocide going on in Israel. This was the president of the University of Michigan. Um, please let me summarize here for a moment what you just told us. It's, it's, um, it's, it's shocking and, uh, and also, um, yeah, yeah. We know that unfortunately you're not the only one who is experiencing this as a Jewish student uh, on campus and college in the United States and elsewhere. Um, so what you experienced is in the, during a, um, a lecture series, a lecture that for which you receive credits uh, in, a, in a room of a thousand uh, listeners, an audience of, with, of a thousand people, um, the speaker who, who, who happens to come from an anti-racism organization in this case, right? Fighting racism uh, projects, uh, shows a slide with uh, the prime minister of Israel uh, next to Adolf Hitler, both with um, the term genocide on their forehead. Uh, and then uh, it goes on with uh, showing Israel as a puppet state of the United States with pigs and money bags and all kinds of anti-Semitic, classic anti-Semitic tropes. So we have we have demonization first of the prime minister of Israel and in such a way that he's even, you know, you, you get a Holocaust inversion there, right? Um, like the Jewish prime minister or the prime minister of Israel is like the Nazis, right? Yes. Um, and um, and we get uh, 
uh, the the classic anti-Semitic tropes like Jews with money um, uh, and and controlling money and using money for the wrong purposes. Um, also in those slides, the the audience doesn't protest where this is an audience that would certainly protest if it would be racism against any other group or 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 discrimination of any other minority. But in this case, they were silent. Your professor stays silent, who's sitting next to you. Uh, you feel totally alone, which which must be an, must have been such an awful experience for you. Um, you walk out, you, you have the courage to come back, which is incredible, I think. Um, and then you um, you speak up. Uh, you go to the to the dean. You go even to the president um, of the university, and um, and then the president says. The dean has no idea what to do, asks you for advice, right? And then the president says, well, it's actually not anti-Semitism. It's, uh, you can just, you can say that Israel is a genocidal uh, state. Um, that's not, that's so subjective to, uh, to say that's anti-Semitism. And then, so you advise to, um, to use in the future, the definition that is adopted by the international community, by the US, by the EU, uh, for instance, and some other countries um, that says, you know, if you criticize Israel, that's not necessarily anti-Semitic, but if you cross a certain line, then it becomes anti-Semitic criticism of Israel. And uh, demonizing Israel and comparing Israel to the Nazis who, who exterminated millions and millions of, of people from minorities just because they were a part of a minority. To, to compare any Israeli to that, even the prime minister is so gross and so certainly anti-Semitic according to that internationally adopted definition, right? Um, and um, I, and um, so, they didn't want to accept that definition in the University of Michigan. So unfortunately, all of what you just said is absolutely true. Um, the university did not want to adopt the definition. They didn't feel, they felt that they already had a definition against um, all forms of hatred and that um, anti-Semitism wasn't deserving of having its own definition. I then replied, okay, so let's have a definition for all of the isms. And I was met with rejection. Um, and it, yeah, it, it was truly an eye-opening experience to have been speaking with these high-level educators and hear them basically saying anti-Semitism, you know, this is okay. This isn't worthy of an apology. I would like to share some historic information with Alexa. First of all, University of Michigan is a public university. And I went to Michigan State University, the other <laughs> major, also public. And in the winter term of 1967, the university during its speaker series invited the leader of the American Nazi party as an official speaker. Now, because there was warning ahead of time, my future husband, we met on the newspaper, wrote a, an opinion piece and organized a protest. And we went to hear the speaker wearing armbands or something. And that was the first time I had just turned uh, 19 that I had ever heard how you could take true sentences and string them together to make absolute lies. Yeah. But my point is that this is how many years, more than 50 years ago, Public University of Michigan is inviting this speaker. And now how far have we not come to, to, to when you were a senior, 2018, 2019? This to me is even um, adds um, distressed on top of everything else. Absolutely. So, so, go ahead. No, please go ahead. I want to even go further to tell you that 
the university, since they didn't adopt a definition of anti-Semitism, they did not know how to react to any other forms of anti-Semitism that came onto university's campus. And just this year, um, there were tons of incidents on the university where there were blood handprints on the Hillel. And there was a rock that was, it's the, um, the famous rock on university's campus. Everyone paints it. Um, and so it was painted for pride. And over that, it was painted the words F Israel, like, um, you know, uh, Zionist equals pigs or rhetoric like that um, on the rock. And the university, like you said, if this were any other form of hatred, would come out with a statement um, making a blatant apology for that racism, Islamophobia, whatever it was. Well, instead, they came out with the kind of all lives matter statement that was saying, well, actually, um, you know, we don't condone any hatred on campus. And this was in reference to the anti-Semitism that was going on. We don't condone any hatred on campus. Um, and that includes anti-Asian hate, um, racism, uh, anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, or anti-Palestinian and more. And so not so, only did the university not focus on what it was and call it out for what it was, which was anti-Semitism, but they made it a political statement. And they had to, you know, they had to bring in the anti-Israel, anti-Palestinian conflict into their statement. And there was no, well, we don't condone anti-Israel, Israelis, anti-Israelis. So it was very disheartening to see. And had they adopted that definition three years ago, before that, um, you know, none of these situations would have gotten as out of control as they have. Right. So the university didn't feel comfortable or so um, to speak out against anti-Semitism as such um, and felt it was... Uh, insulting all kinds of other minorities if it would do so. Um, so it's, University of Michigan wasn't certainly, certainly not a safe space for Jewish students that way, right? Um, my question about all this also to you, Alexa, is were there um, organizations, Jewish organizations or other organizations that helped you in your uh, fantastic reaction of not uh, uh, turning inwards in silence, but turning outwards to, um, to, to address this with the leadership of the university. Yeah, thanks. Um, I definitely received an outpour of support from the Jewish community and it was incredible. Um, I also received a ton of hatred messages um, uh, as well. And so I did turn to the Jewish community and um, there were many organizations that I chatted with and they gave me some insight. Um, one in particular helped me that helped me the most was the ICC, which is the Israel um, Campus Coalition. Um, and they really um, helped me find, you know, different cir circumstances to relate this situation to um, really did the, did the research, um, which was so helpful when I was a senior and still in all 18 credits of classes. Um, but ultimately what I had decided, and I have to mention, I received so much um, guidance from my older brother, Dan. He, um, he was a, a working for UN Watch, which is, oh, yeah. yeah, with Hillel Noor. Um, and they basically um, call out the UN for their anti-Semitism at the UN. Um, and he was just such a mentor to me. And um, he really helped guide me through all of it. And it was so overwhelming. And it, 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 I, I really had to weed out, you know, who I could talk to. And um, I ultimately decided that I wanted to talk with other students. 
Um, and so that is what I was referring to is when I gathered students, um, Jewish students on campus to call for the university to adopt this definition. Um, I thought it was more powerful to have a student movement calling for this rather than have all of the Jewish like uh, organizations um, call for it because that happens all the time. Um, and this was something that I thought we could be unique in doing. Um, and it unfortunately it failed because we didn't get the, the definition adopted. But what it did give me was, you know, a chance to unite Jewish students against anti-Semitism on campus. And that's a hard thing to do. Not many people, I will say not many people care so much to um, go, you know, to that end to put up a fight. Um, but also a lot of people are scared to do it too. It's I certainly had bias from professors after this whole situation. And um, so it was really nice to see that people were so connected against this hatred that was happening and no, um, they're not being an apology for it even worse. Um, so that was, you know, a big takeaway. So you didn't succeed in, in changing the definition of anti-Semitism of, of the university, but you did succeed in mobilizing uh, other Jewish students in you know protesting against this anti-Semitism and probably not letting them feel all alone as individuals. Um, and also um, uh, you said you had help from the um, Israel uh, coalition on campus and uh un watch um, my brother yeah your brother yes. and um so i i come i really i admire your your courage and and leadership in this it's so necessary and um you said you also got you know you got disadvantaged also in your in your academic work because you some professors were biased after you speak spoke up and and that's what i what we hear a, a lot very wise for instance who is a, a leader at this moment in um, speaking up against anti-semitism also says in several uh, pieces she wrote and also in uh, in podcasts and interviews you know we we have to make noise. We have to speak up like you did, uh, but it will, and we have to be prepared to make a personal sacrifice like she did, right? She left the New York Times because of anti-Semitism at, uh, at, at, at the newspaper. So you also brought that sacrifice and, and I really, really um, commend you for that. Yeah, Phyllis. Thank you. And now you're talking to high school students, encouraging them. So tell us about that. Yes. Like, so like the natural, how you progressed. Yeah, that is the biggest accomplishment of all because I am giving this voice to the future generation of college students who are going to go through this with where, you know, the times are headed. Um, and so even though I didn't succeed in getting the definition adopted, I hope that, you know, I give the students the confidence and the courage to be able to continue that fight and, um, you know, stand up for what is right and stand up for themselves. And it's been an incredible opportunity to speak to these high school students and hear their amazement, honestly, and what I did. And I'm like, well, I didn't do that much. <laughs> like, all I did is, you know, just speak up against what I thought was wrong or I knew was wrong um, for that matter. Um, and it's sad, honestly, that we have to um, commend ourselves, honestly, for speaking up because I really, truly, I just hope that that is a standard in the future, being able to stand up against anti-Semitism, which shouldn't be so um, intimidating. And it is. Um, so really at just being able to you know, share with them my story and um, give them that courage. And um, we did like different training sessions on how you can speak up or different ways um, to what of what you can say when someone says something to you that is anti-Semitic or 
that you feel is, because ultimately if you feel that it's anti-Semitism, then it is more than likely it is. <laughs> so let's be specific here to help our listeners. How can, uh, how do you speak? In other words, can people contact you to speak to groups? Uh, now with Zoom, it, you don't you have to be physically uh, in the same place. And can you tell us uh, two things? Some of the things that you tell students to say, and what are their questions? What do you find are their biggest fears? I mean, when they when you speak, what do they say? Yeah, so it's a good question. Um, I, when I speak to these kids, really, um, or young adults, um, I tell them to ask themselves, what about that situation made you feel uncomfortable? And usually that's, how they're able to identify what the anti-Semitic remark was. Um, and we teach them to be able to speak eloquently to um, people who have, so basically we do like these trainings where they'll speak to um, someone who is like a professor or, you know, posing as a professor and just really give them like, um, the toolbox to explain the facts about what anti-Semitism is, the history, the tropes. Um, and so we give them that little bit of education, um, but also it just really comes down to confidence. And the more that they speak about it, the more that they realize all these different situations, we give them um, real circumstances that happened on campus and they like role play basically um, if they were in that situation and giving them that confidence and that understanding will prepare them um, for I, what I hope not to, what I hope does not happen to them, but unfortunately I know will. Do any um, of the students who are in high school tell you that they've already experienced anti-Semitism and have not known what to say? Yes, and I can't believe it because when I was in high school, it wasn't a thing. And that was in 2015. So it's really crazy how um, politicized and just, I don't know, just um, how anti Semitism has been creeping up in just politics um, in the US these days. And um, they, yeah, mo for the most part, um, they're very, shocked um they're not really sure if it like they question whether it is anti-semitic um i know that when they asked me like how how did i speak up um it was like so shocking to them because it was like felt like as if they weren't they they weren't worthy of speaking up like they felt that way like they weren't in these times Mm -hmm. their voice was so unpopular that it wasn't even worth speaking up. And um, I guess what I'm trying to say is that um, there, there's a lot in high school, um, but there are a lot of amazing organizations that are training these kids. Like we're at, right on for Israel invited me to speak, for example. Um, so I think that there's a lot of good stuff um, that's helping them prepare. Which organizations, for instance, are are helping high school students, uh, and you know, with this anti-Semitism and to face it and speak up against it? Yeah. So, Right On for Israel um, is an organization that I believe is through the Jewish Federation, and um, a lot of temples are having education educational programs. Like I know I spoke at. Um, with kids at my temple, um, TDJ. Um, so there's, there's a lot of different. Yes. And we, and we also know uh, from one of our um, earlier episodes two weeks ago uh, or a week ago um, uh, that um, there is uh, Zachary um, Zimmerman yeah. who is, uh, who started to Gen Z. Yeah. Um, and Jews. And he's also educating people of Generation Z under 25 years old awesome. uh, yeah. about what and when is it anti Semitism and what could you do against it? Right. 
Yes, and he'll have better answers for you than I will. No, um, but, but it's what strikes me is the mental state that Jewish students are in when the whole environment is so anti-Israel or anti-Zionism and sometimes bluntly anti-Jewish. Um, and that that your mental state goes into a, a state of slavery almost, right? Where you don't feel you have the right to speak up. Yes. That it's very sad. Good. It's very sad. Very understandable and very sad. Can you give us, as we're uh, closing in, and we're going to give you a chance to say last thoughts, but if you could just give us one example of role-playing, just, uh, just to show how, uh, how I don't want to say simple, but that it doesn't require hours and hours of training, but it really is a mind shift into being able to speak up. Is there an example that you could give that maybe a kid has brought to you and you've worked with that student? So a lot of what we do is um, when the subject of Israel comes up. So I don't know, I don't want to make it necessarily about Israel because um, I know there's, you know, some line between anti-Semitism and Israel, criticism of the Israels, uh, excuse me, um, but if you want to pretend to be uh, the president <laughs> of the university where um, my situation occurred, uh, we could try to <laughs> play on that. Okay, I'll be the president. <laughs> Let Evelyn be the president. <laughs> sure. Okay. So wh wh why are you welcome in my office? Why would you, would you like to see me, Alexa? Well, the reason that I am speaking with you today is because I felt incredibly isolated in my college campus, in my classroom, um, for being a Jew. And the reason that I felt that way is because if anyone equates someone, a Jew, an Israeli, the prime minister of Israel for that matter, to the acts of Adolf Hitler, then that is saying that he is responsible for something like the Holocaust. And I had ancestors in the Holocaust. I have many friends whose grandparents were in the Holocaust and I know their stories. And to make the equivalence is so wrong and so anti-Semitic and so hurtful to me and to all of my Jewish friends um, that I'm trying to let you know that when something like this happens, there needs to be an apology and there needs to be some sort of way to determine how um, you know, this happened in the first place. Why was he invited? And secondly, how do you go from there? How do you apologize? Um, and I honestly don't feel like your apology um, at all was respectful to me as someone who felt this isolated in their campus um, and respectful to the Jewish community as a whole, because you said that what I experienced was subjective. And that's not really fair to me because how I felt, I know that that is not subjective, that is anti-Semitism. So really a lot of what you feel and making it about you know, your story and the emotional part, but also um, you know, actionable change that they can take. That was an excellent example. And <laughs> thank you, yeah. Yes. So now why don't you give us your last thoughts and any ideas to help uh, our listeners. And you've been an incredible guest because really this is very, very valuable information. Thank you so much. Yeah, so um, what I will say is if you are you know, on campus or anywhere for that matter, it doesn't just have to be if you're a student, if you experience anti-Semitism um, you know, from a higher up place, then one, leave the room. <laughs> but two, if you feel, you know, like your voice can make a change, then definitely bring it to people's attentions. Because if I had not brought the situation up, no one would have ever known that this happened in a mandatory classroom. Um, and I think that's so important that we get these stories out because it's happening. Um, I just saw on Twitter that 
Um, there's like 54% of um, the hateful crimes that occurred in this past year was towards Jews and it was anti-Semitism. And nobody, nobody knows that. It's like crazy that there isn't so much attention to this. Um, and in terms of on campus, I really do think that being connected with other students in this effort and this change is so powerful. And I saw so many, you know, points where I did think that we were going to be successful, but also looking back on it, I have a lot of ideas. Um, so obviously, of course, um, I will provide my contact information. Um, at, yeah, and um, just one of those is starting um, your own like task force on campus and be a voice for Jewish students who don't necessarily have, you know, confidence in speaking up, be that, um, that organization, have people be able to fill out forms um, of, you know, whether they have faced anti-Semitism anonymously um, and have a group of people who are willing to write off ads and um, email the regents, people that have um, social media, um, attention so that all of you guys can unite together. And I think that will be the most powerful change. I wish we could clone you, Alexa, <laughs> and sprinkle you across the college campuses of the, of the United States and the world. So thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Thank our listeners. Uh -huh. I just want uh -huh. to say, please, those of you who haven't uh, watched the documentary that Evelyn's in called Never Again is Now, do it. It's free. Just you can go to join neveragainisnow.com. You can read more about my free nonfiction Holocaust theater project at thinedgeofthewedge.com. And whenever you can, without putting yourself in physical danger, speak up against anti-Semitism and all hate.